example, you know, that I will use throughout the the talk uh, to make it a bit more practical for you as well. So I hope after this talk, you will understand the basic concepts of domain driven design and a little bit how to apply it as well. It's it's not very easy, like it takes some time to get used to into practice, but at least I, I, I think you will um, know all the the fundamentals that you need. And yeah, my name is Pete Ulrich. Thank you very much, Okot, my fellow remote engineer, my colleague <laughs> that I'm very happy about having uh, for introducing me. And yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. It's PJ Ulrich, or I have a course recently um, published. It's called Build an MVP with Elixir. And I also have a blog post uh, or like a write blogs on my personal website at peterulrich.com. All right. But before you continue further, how, how would you love the question? Would you love them being after the speech, after the session or just in between? Um, I will I will take breaks, um, you know, in between, and then I will ask for questions. So okay. this nice. is okay. All right, then let's get started. Um, first of all, everything that I will tell you today is very much taken from the book, Learning Domain Driven Design. Uh, it's a great book. I'm currently still reading it, but it uh, it's it it gives you a very practical introduction to domain driven design. So if you want to learn more about the topic, I can highly recommend buying this book and reading it. Now, the first question that you might have is, what is domain driven design? And um, let me you know give you a little example here. So my example, my running example through the entire uh, talk, will be the um, the boat you make boat face shipping company and if you don't know the background history of boat make boat face basically the the red boat up here there was a new research vessel developed by the uk and they had a public um form a public question where everybody on the internet could uh, submit their ideas for how to name that boat so they asked the public and then the public could vote on the name as well and you should never ask the public to vote on things because they will come up with funny things like boat make boat face which was uh, the the number one um, option, and everybody voted for it. But then the UK said, "Well, we can't call our research vessel Boaty McBoatface." So what they did is they recalled it to I think the Sir Attenborough, and then they have an uh, a submarine, automatic submarine, which is now called Boaty McBoatface. So that's a background story of Boaty McBoatface. But today's example will be about a shipping company, and imagine that you're a consultant, and they come to you and say, "Well, in my case, you know, Peter." We have a problem. Our problem is that our software never allows problems that our 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 Yeah, thank you. Um so the problem here is that you know uh the software that they build never aligns with the business. They have problems, you know, that the the stakeholders don't feel the engineers understand them. The engineers always build something different from what the stakeholders actually need. Uh, the whole thing is misaligned. They don't get forward. Like the software is actually a problem instead of a supporting tool. Um, and they had many different attempts. Like they tried to build new things and then it failed and nobody wanted to use it. And they had to start over and a lot of money was wasted that way. So that's, they come to you and ask, you know, how can we improve that? And the first thing that, you know, you look at is the reason why did these projects fail? And you interview them and they will come up and say, basically, it was miscommunication. We feel it's miscommunication, uh, or you might identify that. So you understand um, that the engineers and the stakeholders, they don't communicate well. They don't understand each other. Um, your stakeholders want one thing and the engineers build another because the engineers think it should be different or they have a different idea of the, the business. And now the goal of this intervention, like the goal of what you want to achieve is that the software is aligned with the business. And you want to achieve that by reducing the miscommunication between the engineering departments and also the, the operations departments. And uh, how could you do that? Well, you do that by designing the software in a way that it is uh, aligned with the business domain. So you, you design the software based on the business domain. And that's how the name, like that's the whole idea of DDD because uh, it is called, like that's how we came up with the name business domain driven software design. And that's basically domain-driven design is the long form is business domain-driven software design. So you design your software based on your business domain. So now that you understood what it is in theory, um, you might ask, well, why should I care? Because um, DDD helps you to understand the business better in which you work. And that better understanding helps you to make better software decisions 
better software decisions make you more successful more success usually equals more pay more money more pay so uh if you want to just improve uh, your engineering skills if you want to become more valuable if you want to have more experience and just be in general more, more valuable to your company ddd is something you should look into and i will say that before like ddd is very opinionated it is quite a big framework um and it's not very easy to apply so it, it takes a lot of commitment and it takes um really a lot of stakeholders to buy into this otherwise you will fail however just by knowing about these concepts and by understanding the problems that these concepts are trying to solve, you will already learn a lot about how you can improve as an engineer. So by just having these concepts in your mind, not actually applying them day to day, but just being aware of the problems they solve, you will already have learned a lot. So that's why uh, it's, I think it's important to everybody, even if you don't want to use DDD for designing a software. Now, you might ask where to start. And the first thing, like there are two steps in the design process. The first one is the strategic modeling. And that means you go into the problem space. You talk to stakeholders, you talk to operations people, you talk to everybody who's not an engineer about the business. You ask them, what do you think of the business? Like, what do you understand? What we're doing? What are you doing? You ask them, you know, what do you do day to day? You understand the entire business as much as possible. Now, you as an engineer probably don't have to do all of that stuff. You don't have to talk to, you know, a thousand people in your company, but you might have somebody like an architect that has the, the job of doing this every day. And so the first thing is you go out there and you try to understand the, the business as much as possible. And there are a couple of tools that you can use, so a couple of concepts that will guide you. And uh, the, the goal here is to define your domain in which your business operates. And I will explain all these uh, underlined words after this so you will first define the domain of your business and then you will decompose that domain into subdomains and eventually bounded context and again i will explain all these uh these concepts later on but that's your your goal uh, that's your your uh, strategy and the goal here sorry about the second one the goal one the goal of the strategic modeling is to structure the system so to, to design your system and to align it with the business so it's about the, the big picture, the structure of your system, maybe even your team structure, engineering team structure eventually. So it's very high level. Once you have that high level uh, definition or the design, then you can go into tactical modeling. And that is basically the solution space. So like the problem space is very much the business and understanding the problem. And that is also a concept that's really interesting to know about to, do, to uh, separate when you build something into problem space and solution space. Because a problem often is that people hear, like they just listen to a couple of sentences that person that somebody says, like, I have this problem. When I do this, nothing happens. And immediately they jump to the solution. Like they think, oh, I can just fix that by like, you know, having a new button or something. But they don't fully understand the problem. Because what stakeholders tell you is mostly only the absolute high level uh, abstract thing. Like, or they don't give you all the context. That's actually much more um, uh, uh, terrible. Like they will only tell you, oh, you know, I wanted to to sort the table in a certain way and it, it doesn't let me do the sorting. And you're like, oh, you know, then we just add another sorting. But you don't understand the problem that the sorting will solve for them. Like you don't know why they want to so sort a table in a certain way. Because maybe they only always need the um, the top five rows because that's what they're working on you know and then you 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 actually if you understand that you might design the entire system in a different way like you might hide everything they have completed and you might only show what they still have to complete like you know they are like a lot of solute like eventually you will have a solution that actually solves the problem and not just gives them a little workaround right so by staying in the problem space as long as possible to understand the problem as much as possible is very very valuable and will help you make better solutions now, again, we went from the strategic modeling. That's the first step. We Now we got to technical modeling. That's the solution space. So here's, you know, we have our global design. And now we go into every single little component of that design. And we model, like we design how it should look like. So it's very low level. It's very in, in the details. Um, it's basically every, like, you know, software that we build, we have a look at. So that is the technical modeling. Uh, here you have different concepts, like you design your bounded context, uh, you design every bounded context that you found in the strategic modeling, 
you design it with domain models, value objects, entities, aggregates, domain services, and domain events. And I will explain again all of these eventually. And the goal of this is to implement the system in a way that it really represents the domain concepts and the rules that exist in your business. Because every business has rules. You might call it rules or logic. Um, if this is a certain way, then that might not happen, but on a business level, not just like, you know, if, if whatever, something is not active, then you should do something else. It's like, it's bigger business processes. So um, that's the second step. Now, uh, let's start with the strategic modeling, the problem space. And then here we have domains, subdomains, and bottom context. So first of all, let's talk about domain and subdomains. The domain is the company's service to its client. It's basically what the company does. So if you have Boaty McBoatface, our shipping company, it provides shipping. You know, people uh, give us packages and we deliver them to wherever they have to go. Now you have something like Safaricom and they provide mobile internet. They also provide you with a you know phone call, like you can call, you can text, but they also have something like M-Pesa and, uh, sorry, like M-Pesa. And that's something completely different again. That's about money. So, you know, like even here, like if I would ask you, what is the domain of Safaricom? You might say, well, it's mobile internet and uh, voice, voice and text messages. But M-Pesa is like, you know, a whole, a whole nother product they have. So here you might already have to make a decision. Like, do I want to build a system that covers all of that? You know, text messaging, like texting, uh, calling and mobile data and M-Pesa and everything else the Safaricom has. Probably you don't want to do that. So the domain is already something where you can say, my, like my system that I'm designing only covers that part of the company. Like if you think about Amazon, Amazon is so much more than just e-commerce, you know, buying something. And it's so much more nowadays. So you really have to decide for yourself which part of the company you want to focus on. So that's the first step. You need to define your domain that you want to analyze. Then once you've done that, you can break down that domain into subdomains. And they are like fine grain areas of the business. And I will explain later how you can do the decomposition there. And the subdomain, all of them together form the business domain. You know, so your entire domain, you need to break it down. And every piece that is kind of technical related needs to fall into one subdomain. Okay. Now, in our case, Boaty McBoatface, it is a shipping company. So what we have is a sales company department, you know, they might call up companies and ask, Hey, do you want to ship something big? Do you want to ship cars to whatever, you know, from Kenya to Asia, for example, uh, they might also have a fleet management company because they have vehicles on the ground that deliver the packages. So they need to manage the, the fleet of vehicles and they have customer service too, because after, you know, maybe a package gets lost or you have some questions where it is, you know, you need to have somebody that answers your call. So all of these things are already subdomains of the big company. And every single one of them can't really work as an individual company. They all work together for providing this one service to the client, which is shipping. Now, um, how do you identify these subdomains? Mostly, they are already there. So you can look at the organizational structure. You know, every company will have such a thing. They usually already have departments and they have teams within that department. And that is a good indication. However, it is not the best indication, but it's a good starting point. Um, because what you should do then is in every department, identify use cases, you know, something like, uh, well, as a, as a salesperson, I want to create a shipment for a customer, you know, so I'm, ha I'm having the customer on the phone and I want to enter the shipment details. Uh, that would be a use case. Uh, same with fleet management. Like I want to see the information of a vehicle that I have to maintain, you know, all these use cases. And you can ignore the ones that are not re related to software because we are building software and, you know, you don't care whether, uh, like how the driver, well, actually it's still software, but how the driver might um, load the packages into the car, into the vehicle. Like that is a manual task. It has nothing to do with software. You can, you can ignore that. Now, if you look at subdomains, like the what the Learning DDD book says is that subdomains are sets of coherent use cases. And that means that uh, like coherent use cases are use cases that involve the same actors, the same business entities, and the, all you, they all use the same set of data. So um, if you have like a salesperson 
and uh, a driver, like the salesperson might create a shipment, but the driver needs to see the uh, recipient address, like the delivery address, right? So they use the same data, but they're not the same actors. You know, they're different. And also the business entities, like um, uh, maybe that's a department, you know, like business entity is a little vague in this, this regard. But so what you do basically is you look, okay, which use cases are performed by the same actors? Like what do all the drivers do? What do all the salespeople do? And then you you see, okay, you have like all the salespeople and they work on these use cases, but these use cases use a completely different set of data than these use cases. You know, they're completely unrelated. So then you might already be able to split those into two subdomains. Yeah, that takes a lot of experience. And it, frankly, it's up to you to decide. But, you know, rather create small subdomains than bigger ones. You know, that that is one guideline. In our case, both to make both face, we might have, like, we look at one department right now, uh, the fulfillment service. So that is the serv the um, fulfillment department that, had, like, takes care of that the package is actually delivered to the customer. And then here we might have a subdomain that's called package tracking. Then we have driver scheduling and delivery planning, which is an algorithm. You can call it del delivery planning algorithm. You can also call it delivery planning if there's more to the algorithm, like more than just the algorithm, but maybe also some data. So we already have, we already identified three delivery, uh, three subdomains. All right. Now that we have the, uh, the subdomains, Okay, um, you might ask, well, are all subdomains equal? And the answer to that is no. You have to prioritize subdomains. And that's also important for uh, for you and like for the company, you know, that, that's also important for the engineering teams. Like how do you allocate the headcount and the, the capacity you have? So it, it's important to define the subdomains into three different categories. And they all differ based on the complexity of the subdomain, like how complex is the, the thing they do? And do they give us business differentiation? Like, do they make our business uh, unique? Are they our competitive advantage? Something that we do that nobody else does, you know, or somebody else tries to imitate what we are doing, but they just can't because it's such a complex problem that we have solved the best. So that's business differentiation versus the complexity of the problem. And if you if you draw them on a on a um, like a map like this, you see uh, four quadrants, and the the most important one is the core the core subdomains here. And these core subdomains they have the highest complexity. Uh, they're super you know complex to implement, and they also give us the the unique like the competitive advantage. Um, you know they make us who we are. That's why people know that uh, Boat to Make Boat Face is the best company for shipping. Yeah, and then you have a generic subdomain, and that is something that is complex, but it doesn't give us any competitive advantage. You know, that might be our finance system, our HR system, maybe like uh, our uh, fleet vehicle database, something like that, um, authentication. You know, it can all be stuff like that, and it's just, it's very it's called generic. So uh, high complexity, but doesn't give us any business advantage. So that's generic. And then the last one on the on the bottom right is supporting. And that is something that can or cannot give us business differentiation. It might be in, important for delivering our service. It might, it might not be important at all, you know, but it, it's not complex. That's the main point. It's not, it's very simple to implement. Um, and everybody could implement it within a week or two. Like we don't really care about it, even if they would steal it from us. It's something everybody has and, you know, we don't we don't care about it. So that's, yeah, and these, like, you have to categorize the, the subdomains into these three um, categories. And if we do that, we might see that our delivery planning algorithm is our core domain. Like, it gives us the unique, the competitive advantage because nobody can uh, plan the delivery as accurately and reliably as we do, you know, and, and uh, promise a fast delivery that is within the time window that we give the customer. Um, so that's our competitive advantage, basically. Now we should spend as much as possible, like as much time and capacity as possible on this core domain, because that is what makes our business unique. That is the core, the most important thing of our business. You know, we can replace HR software, but we can never replace our algorithm that uh, manages our delivery planning, for example. Now the next one, like package tracking, 
it is a complex problem, but there are, there are already solutions out there that solve it for us. And other people have sold it and there are things we can buy. You know, we can buy like a, a tracking system and just use it. So it is very complex, but it doesn't give us any advantage as a business. So we should buy it if we can, you know, or use it. Like authentication is one example. If you create a Phoenix application, you can just create an authentication service out of the box. Um, you know, you don't want to like think twice about it. Just use it, adopt it and forget about it. Now, supporting could be something like driver scheduling. You know, it is simple to do, maybe, like maybe not, depends on your situation, but it is, it's not as complex as having our delivery planning algorithm. Um, it is not complex. It doesn't really give us a business advantage. Everybody has to schedule the driver, uh, every shipping company. And that's why it's a supporting, a support, supporting uh, a subdomain. But it is something, you know, we might be able to buy, but it's also not too difficult to build. So we can just build it ourselves. But this is something that, you know, we build ourselves, but we shouldn't like have the brightest and smartest engineers working on that. It's okay if juniors do it or somebody, you know, that just keeps the lights on. It's just supporting. All right. Now that you know about these different types of subdomains, you might ask, are they equally important? And I already said, no, they aren't. So you have to, you know, look at different characteristics of these subdomains. Um, the core one, the core subdomain is our competitive advantage. It is the absolute most important thing that our company has and nobody else does. So that makes our company unique. Generic and supporting, they don't give us any competitive advantage. In terms of complexity, core and generic are high. Supporting, very simple. Now, volatility is another thing that's important. Uh, volatility is high in the core domain. So that means that we might change it a lot. Like we have to adopt it. We have to ev uh, evolve it. Uh, we have to adjust it according to our business, you know? So there is a lot, there will be a lot of engineering work and we need to make sure that we have enough capacity there. With generic and supporting, the volatility will low. Like once we implemented our driver scheduling system, you know, we're good. We don't have to change it in the near future. Uh, same with our authentication system. Once implemented, it's fine. Now, the, the idea here is that in terms of implementation, the core domain you do in-house, no way around it. Like that's the expertise. It's not only about the, the work, but it's also about the expertise that you keep in the company. You know, it's something that people call in intellectual property sometimes. If you have a very good, like the Google uh, search algorithm, you know, it's the best example of this. It's super complex. They build it in-house. They never want to outsource that. They don't want that, that knowledge to leave the company. Then generic is something you can buy or adopt. And supporting is something you might in, uh, build in-house or you might outsource it to an agency or a freelancer who just build it for you because you don't care about it. All right. Now, okay, now we define our domain and I don't have our subdomains. What do we do next? And the answer to that is bounded contexts. So now we have our subdomains and they are like how the, com the company is structured. And now we can design our business around a context based on that. So a bounded context is an area of your domain that has the same rules, models, and language. Um, you know, think in our case, Boaty McBoatface, think about the sales versus the, versus the fulfillment department or subdomain. Like a sales uh, department, they think about shipment as something they have to sell, you know, and then they they pass it on. They don't care about it. Everything, all they need is the name of the the sender, the recipient address, how many packages, how you know how big they are, and then whether it's paid or not. That's all they care about. So for them, a shipment is something that they sell. It's a whole different product. Fulfillment thinks completely different about a shipment. Like they they worry much more about the size, the weight. Uh, how many packages, um, you know, where it needs to go from A to B, what's uh, the the address, you know, the, the most efficient way between these two spots. So they, they think completely different about shipment, like the same thing. So that is also about language. You know, if you ask a uh, sales department how they define shipment, there's something, well, there's something that we sell and fulfillment is something, well, something that we deliver. So they use different languages for, for these things. You know, maybe fulfillment calls it a, a delivery and sales calls it a, a purchase, an order, for example. So they mean the same thing, but they have different words for it. So that's something you should really look out for. And yeah, once you have that, you define your bound of context, basically. You understand, all right, these two people, they use different words for something different or something, sorry, they use different words for something that is the same 
or they use the same words, but they mean something different. And that's usually the case. Like everybody speaks about a shipment, but in sales, they mean an order and in fulfillment, they mean a delivery. So that's something you should really watch out for. And that's how you find your bound of context. You ask the people what they mean by what they use, like the words they use, and then you find where their differences. Okay. Now, the difference between subdomains and bound context is that subdomains, they exist. Like that's how the company is structured. Uh, and bound of context is something we can design. Like the subdomains on the business side of things and like people working and the bound of context is about our software, how we model our software to that domain. So that's the difference. We, we are free to design the bound of context as we please, but they should, you know, kind of, they should be connected to subdomains. So what you usually see is a one-to-one -one relationship between subdomains and bound of context. You know, every subdomain gets one bound of context, but that's very much depending on your situation. Like often you have the situation that one subdomain is very big, like it contains a lot of use cases. Um, and then we need to have multiple bound of context that encapsulate each use case. And sometimes you even have one bound of context that spans multiple subdomains because the subdomains might be small and the bound of, or the bound of context really, like everybody in the, sub, in the subdomains uses the same language, the same rules and the same models. So one bound of context spans all of these subdomains. It's not that often the case. Usually it's the other way around. One subdomain has a lot of bound of context, but again, it depends on your situation. Okay. Now, next up, um, how do you find these bound of context? And the technique that I can re recommend here is called event storming. Basically, what you do, you find a whiteboard, digital or in physical, uh, and then you write, you, you get sticky notes, and you do a couple of things. Um, like, okay, so on, on the whiteboard, you go through every use case, not every, but like the most important use cases, and then you define the actor who does something with that use case, like a salesperson, uh, a, a delivery driver, or it could also be the system. And then you have the sticky notes and you have commands, events, a view, policies, and aggregates. And I will explain each of them later on. So that's what you have. These are your tools. And now what you do is you start at the beginning of your use case and you identify the actor. In our case, that's a delivery point employee. Our use case is a, a customer delivers a shipment to the delivery point. And, you know, like the, the delivery point employee accepts the shipment and says, all right, we got your shipment. Now we will handle the rest. That's our use case. And our use case starts at the point where the del delivery point employee, they go to the view on their computer and they say that uh, a shipment was received. You know, they got the shipment from the, from the customer. And that is a command. Like that's a command that push a button and say, this, is, this shipment is received. Now the next, like out of that command, we create an event, a domain event, which is called shipment received. And that is our, our point where we say, all right, now we can start uh, planning and, and everything, like planning our delivery, basically. And at the end of the day, then we might have a policy like the delivery planning policy. That is our policy that says at the end of the day, we schedule the packages for the next day. You know, it might also be continuous, but I'm just saying at the end of the day, there's one time we have a, a script that runs and it, it plans the, the delivery for the next day. And what it does, it, uh, it it executes a command saying plan deliveries and plan deliveries uses an aggregate, which is in this case, a group of packages. And uh, the aggregate is something where the entire group needs to change or nothing changes at all. So we can't only plan one package out of 10. We always need to plan 10 packages out of 10 or we don't plan them at all. So that's like a, a consistency thing. Now, out of the planning process, we have uh, an event again called deliveries planned. And that's it. You know, that's the end of the use case. And if you write down these sticky notes, if you write down these commands and events and everything, you eventually find that there are uh, some events that are called pivot or pivot events. And they indicate that there is like a, a, a jump, a gap in the, in the use case. Like in our case, um, the shipment received event might be uh, created at 9 a.m. in the morning, you know, and then we have the whole rest of the day until 20, until 12 o'clock at night. And only then we run our delivery planning policy. So these pivot events, they indicate often a boundary between bound and context, like the use case uh, for receiving the shipment in the, 
in the left context with the delivery point employee, it's a completely different context, so to say, than the, the planning thing. So by, by having these like um, time gaps, it's easy to see the boundaries. And that's why we can uh, put the all the the left things, like the use case on the left, we can put into its own context, like the delivery point, boundary context, whatever you want to call it. And the right one we can call delivery planning context, for example. All right. And the last thing here is like notice the difference of language. That's also how you can find the uh, the boundary context. Like on the left side, uh, on delivery point, we say that it's a shipment, like they received a shipment or maybe a package, but whatever, like they use a word shipment. On the right side, it's a delivery. So we don't talk about shipments, we talk about deliveries. We don't care about shipments, we only care about packages. So it's different, like they are completely different uh, ideas, although they all handle the same package, right? The same physical object. So that's already an indication that they that these two things, uh, they, they differ. Now, how do your context interact? That's one last question. After you found the bounded context, you have to uh, have an idea of how they interact. And for that, you can do context mapping. And uh, you have, actually, like I don't have that much time really. So I'm just gonna speed, I'm just gonna skip this one. But basically uh, what you have is like different interaction patterns between bound and context, you know, like delivery planning is a supply of data for the package tracking custom uh, context. Uh, and so on. So they are different. Like in the book, you will read about all these uh, relationships. Now that's the summary of the first part. We uh, talked about what the domain is, the subdomain. We had uh, covered the core supporting generic domains. We talked about bounded context, event storming, and eventually context mapping. Now the second uh, part of the the talk will be about tactical tactical modeling. So that's our solution space. Now we have our domain, our subdomains, and we identified our bounded context and. Uh, now we can start designing each bound of context. Like one bound of context is usually one microservice, but it can also just be one namespace in your application. Like it, it it's a component basically a, that has a boundary around it. And now we can start defining it. And the first thing we need to do is define our domain models. And I mentioned shipment and delivery, like these two things earlier. These are domain models. It's like a, a concept, right? So a domain model is an object that represents a real world thing. And it stores the attributes of that thing. And it also enforces the business rules that apply to the thing. If you think about a, a delivery, for example, like the delivery domain model will contain all the attributes that are needed for the delivery, like the recipient address, the scheduled date, the scheduled time, uh, time frame, uh, the delivery driver, these kind of things. And it also enforces the business rules that apply. Like a delivery, for example, can't be scheduled unless we have a driver for it, for example. There would be a business rule that this domain model enforces. Like if you want to change that stuff, you have to go through that domain model and it will check for itself whether the rules are like complied with or not. All right. So think about the shipment delivery point. You know, you have a shipment which has certain rules and the delivery point has another, another rule. Like for the delivery and the shipment, they have different rules. Okay. Uh, for example, shipment in the delivery point context means that it was paid for. Otherwise, we don't accept the shipment. And in the, the, the delivery context, we don't care about payments. You know, we only care about the package and that we should deliver them. A domain model is represented as either an entity or a value object. An entity is basically something that has the attributes and it has an identity, like a package or a delivery or a shipment. Um, that is something you can identify, you know, like a person, for example. There's only one person, there's only one package, one physical object, so there's only one thing of that. Um, yeah, the value object is something different. It doesn't have an identity, but it only it's only represented by its attributes. And maybe you might even say delivery is the value object because the delivery is identified by the package for that is out for delivery, for delivery, uh, the day or the time frame, whatever and the driver, you know, or the vehicle where it's in. Like that might be a delivery. So it doesn't have an identity because if you reschedule the delivery, we will just delete the old one and we will create a new one, maybe. But a very typical um, example of this is the delivery address. So the address of the recipient. And if we update that address, we don't care about the old one, or maybe we do, but still like it, then address doesn't have uh, an identity but it is a combination of different attributes, like the street, the postal code, the city. And that's like all these three things together make an address, right? 
So just for you to, to know about these two things. And they're immutable. So whenever we create a new one, we destroy or archive the old one and we create a new one. Yeah. But how do you find these domain models? And you can find them by talking to your domain experts. You know, you talk to them and you, you ask them, so what do you use? Like a package, delivery, these kind of things. And then eventually you will find them. Okay. Now, the next, after you find your domain models, you have to find your aggregates. Aggregates are is something a little complex, and I haven't really used them a lot. Like, you will see later why. But in, in general, they are like consistency boundaries about, around multiple domain models. So that means that within an aggregate, one or multiple domain models um, always change together or not at all. You know, like if you have a delivery and the delivery has a package, um, or maybe let's, let's, Nah, what's a good example? I actually have one somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, think about the delivery that has packages and the receiver address. Like if you change the receiver address, also the delivery and package needs to change. You know, the delivery needs to be uh, rescheduled for another address or maybe the packages, like you don't, you can't own, you can only deliver one package and the other two packages are somewhere completely uh, somewhere else. So you always need to make, uh, need to make sure that these three domain models change together and you would have an aggregate boundary around that and uh, only the aggregate can change these models so you go through for example the delivery aggregate and through that you change the packages and the receiver address and also you fetch only through the aggregate it has an aggregate root and a boundary like the aggregate root is um, something that the external uh, models interact with like the delivery aggregate for example so if you want to update packages you can only do that through the delivery aggregate yeah and the boundary is what you have like it has three three domain models and if these three domain models change it ha always has to go through the aggregate and they should be as small as possible so uh in my case i very i think i almost never use an aggregate that had more than one domain model you know it's not uncommon um actually it's uncommon that you have more than one domain model but it depends on your situation yeah but now you have one aggregate okay and you you have three domain models in there and okay that's you know how to update them you always have to go through the aggregate route however if you have multiple domain models that are not in one aggregate that are uh, not uh, connected to each other at all but they are part of the same business rule the same business process how can you update them and the answer to that is domain services that is basically a, a service or a module that applies business rules that apply that change multiple aggregates. So we have shipment and delivery, for example. You know, if our delivery is completed, then we need to mark our shipment as completed. And you know, we should only change these two together. We should never change only delivery or only the shipment. But they're not really two like in one aggregate. You know, they're two completely different things. So we would use the domain service that then updates these two. And in this case, uh, the the uh, flow would be, you know, we the the domain service um, like mark delivery as completed or as delivered uh, checks the business rules. Like, can we mark the shipment as completed? Have all the packages been delivered, uh, or whatever reason this? And then we update the shipment, we update the delivery, and eventually we persist all these changes at once. So again, it's atomic, like either we update both of them or we don't update any, you know, that's a one or zero. And the whole idea behind these updates and, and aggregates and domain services is that you want to keep the consistency. Like you will, you never want to have an inconsistent state where a delivery is marked as delivered, but the shipment is not marked as completed. You know, that is a state that you should never have in your system. And that's why you use these domain services, aggregates, um, and domain models to make sure that that never happens. All right. Uh, well, the last thing, domain events, is something I already showed you earlier, like the yellow flips things. It's an event that marks that something happened meaningful, like delivery completed or shipment completed. Then the past tense, um, like package delivered, and they're the main way of communication between bound and context. So, you know, if you think back about our uh, shipment delivery thing, usually they wouldn't change in one database transaction. Like if they're in two different microservices, the delivery would be marked as delivered. And then the domain event would be fired, like delivery completed. And that domain event then um, updates our shipment. Like our other service, our, our other bound of context marks, like finds that domain event, updates the shipment this way. And uh, eventually, 
they like these events will become your single source of truth. And that's also where the name event sourcing comes from. Like by event sourcing, by having multiple events that build up on each other, we build up a, a sort of truth. So anyway, and that's it. Uh, that was a speed run through the book. But if you want to learn more, there are three books, uh, you know, that are the authority, actually two books. And I added the, the one, like the two authority, like the books that everybody knows about is a blue book by Eric Revens and the red book by Vaughn Vernon. And they're a little bit complicated. The red one is much more theoretical than the blue one, but still it's not very easy to understand. The new book, I would call them the white book. Uh, it's much more practical. So I can recommend that one. And thank you very much. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, here's my Twitter handle. I have a course and a blog post too. So thank you very much. But I was problems that 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 I was How about the that? Is it better? Okay, I think it was a speaker. So yes, so thank you very much, Peter. That, that was a good run. So I, I must be honest, majority of the time I was floating, but I was not sinking. So so yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a, a I've been looking for questions. I don't know whether there's anyone who is as a question. Feel free to to post the question in the chat. But for me, I think I have one or two. So the first one would be, I mean, when, you, when, when, you, when you're deciding to use this, this design pattern, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. What are the systems, okay, which, which you're supposed to use this and which are the system you could, could consider an overkill for, for, for this specific uh, framework? Pattern? Yeah, um, I would only use it if it's a very complex system that you're working with and that has already failed maybe once before like where miscommunication like where you see the problem of miscommunication like what i said in the beginning you know it's a very opinionated framework a very large framework it needs a lot of commitment and buy-in from many stakeholders but yeah you it's it's a tool that might be <clears throat> your last resort your last hope if you have issues that the engineering team always delivers something different than the product or the the stakeholders want so th then you can use this, but you can also use like smaller methodologies of that, you know, just by having ubiquitous language, you know, just by trying to understand the business more and to use their language in, in your software and in your requirements might already help. So you can go all in with the big design and the small design, but usually it helps already if you just think, oh, you know, I need to design my software based on the business and not what I as an engineer think should be the case, which is not the case. So yeah, so, and so I, I also had you mention ubiquitous language, and I've heard of this the, the, the phrase several times. And and so so when you're building business domain, meaning the people the, the business people should be part and parcel of the of the system design and development. I mean, uh, so something I, I know ubiquitous language is where you're using the a, a term which is both understood by the engineers and 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 and, and, and the and the system and the, the business people. So so when you're building this system, is you're supposed to I mean, the, the the system, the business people should be part and parcel of this system. I mean, like, uh, yeah, they're suggesting yeah. things and ideas like that. Yeah, definitely. But it's yeah, it's about the language. Like, you should, as engineers, not use their own language for things. Okay. You know, something we usually have very generic things like a user or an account. And you know, because if you set up the authentication system in Phoenix, immediately you will have a user and oh. accounts as a namespace. But I think that's the biggest problem that we try to be generic and plan ahead for possible problems in the future, which will never occur. And I'm just saying, don't do that. Just use the language that your business uh, stakeholders use, you know, name it the same way. Um, and also, but also a question that sometimes, where, you know, because sometimes uh, uh, business stakeholders, they have very vague idea, like names for something, you know, like a user, but a user is very different for the pattern, uh, depending on who you ask. So then you can ask a little bit like, hey, do you actually mean an employee or actually do you actually mean a, a customer or do you actually mean an admin, you know, uh, and then you can define that language a little bit.
Yeah, but language, I think, is the biggest tool that you have for tackling the miscommunication. You know, you need to have you to, you need to use the same words. Otherwise, you will have to completely different ideas and and talk. Um, uh, you know, not with each other, but across. Why you say like not with each other? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think we have two more questions. The, the, the second, the last one for me, and I think there's another one on the chat. So, mm -hmm. uh, my last question would be: I, I had you mentioned entities, right? So entities. When, when I saw things you're mentioning as entities, examples of them, if I were from OPP, o, o, OP, that is, I would, I would view them as things like, um, which I would say objects. So, yep. so what's the difference between entities in this area and the o, o, OPP related things? Because for me, if I saw something yeah. like this, I would, what would ring in my mind if I were in... Uh, yeah, it's in, a good in, question. I would, I would get a class, that is. It's a good question. I mean, most of the books about DDD, they use Java or C Sharp for the example. So they think about an object as being like a record or in, in, in Elixir would be a, a struct. So just, you know, forget like object is super generic again. That's why I rather like to use model or, you know, entity or value object. But like an, an object is just an element like a record or in our case, a struct. It's like a one thing, you know. So that's a don't, don't confuse like object with the OP object. It's just like one thing that you're talking about. So the last question would be from the platform. So the uh, Twiga is asking that, would this design pattern apply to an MVP? For example, where you are in require, the requirement may not be initially as clear that is, will not be clear that is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to go all in with the strategic modeling about like domains and subdomains and about a context, um, like two things. Namespacing is very important there. So once you create your MVP, try to namespace, you know, like my app dot accounts dot something, my app dot, you know, whatever packages dot something. Like just try to to have good namespaces and not put everything in one generic namespace. That's already a uh, helpful first step for creating boundaries between your contacts. You know, and like just having boundaries already will structure your soft, your software better. And the other, um, you know, big learning from this that you can apply even in MVP is to just talk with your business stakeholders. Like just ask them what you actually want, like just define the requirements and use their language and understand as an engineer, understand their business and how it works and how it runs uh, and what they actually need. Because if you understand how the business actually works, you can much better design your, so your software also to, um, uh, how you say, uh, to do something that they might need in the future, you know, to, to make yourself ready for the future because you might anticipate well, we have a shipping company here, you know, but we might also develop a new product that might need this data, for example. Like, so that's just, just, you know, uh, talk to your business stakeholders, ask them and try to understand how the business works. And that already helps you a lot. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you very much, Peter. So, I mean, the last question would be with regards, not, not related to the talks, but with regards to your course. Yeah. So I, I saw sometimes back, you mentioned that, um, the course was being offered. Uh, there were some offers. I don't know whether the offer is still open, especially yeah. for the Elixir, Elixir Africa community. And and how do we access that? Yeah. So if you so my course is build an MVP with Elixir, where I show you how to get started with building your own product, how to deploy it, uh, how to eventually also get paid for it. You know, uh, with credit card and everything. And if you want to have the the, the course, it's you can access it here through the link slash course I have coupons, so if you are not, you know, if you if you want to have some help with buying the course, I can I have you know 100% off um, discount codes. So just uh, I'm in the Elixir Kenya WhatsApp group. Yeah, probably the WhatsApp group is the best. So just shoot me a private message on WhatsApp, and then I'm happy to to help you and send you the the coupon. No problem. Yeah. Thanks. Was this worth your time? Hope so. Please subscribe to stay in the loop for more of this content. In case of any queries or suggestions, feel free to hit us up on Twitter. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to ElixirConf Africa 2024. And here's the best part about this one. It'll be an in-person event. What a good excuse to come to Kenya. Again, we're super grateful for helping make this a success and definitely looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers.